In thinking about virtue, uh, the nation and the market, I want to put before us uh, the ideas of two thinkers, um, both of whom emphasize this in different ways. One is Roger Scruton, who recently passed away, a great philosopher, conservative thinker, who emphasized the centrality of the nation to the liberal order, to achieving liberal goods. We actually need a pre-liberal foundation. And of course, part of his argument was the centrality of the nation to the market. Wilhelm Rupke was a German economist, exiled uh, during Nazi Germany's reign during World War II to Turkey, uh, but also provided a profound moral, virtue-based justification for the free market and is responsible, most would argue, for the German economic miracle that began in 1948. Both of these thinkers emphasize in different ways that the market stands within an overall order of morality, that the market is a fragile achievement, an artifact, if you will, that emerges from a healthy ecology of civil society, stable political institutions, the rule of law, pro-growth policies, and a host of virtues that we bring to the market, honesty, responsibility, prudence, courage, among others. And these are formed in civil society, family, religion, and the countless interactions we have with other people that shape us into decent and honorable persons. So we're currently experiencing in this country right now numerous problems and opportunities, um, both in our politics and in our market, that illustrate the cogency of Scruton and Rupka's thinking. We have leading companies that accrue tremendous gains, we have wealth and equities, uh, wealth growth and equities that has uh, been tremendous over the past two decades despite our great financial crisis. Yet government spending continues to grow, including in the areas of entitlement spending, which induces slowly and inexorably corresponding changes in the behavior of Americans regarding work and discipline. Federal and state debts are gargantuan. Wealth and income gains for certain workers haven't been robust uh, in certain periods over the last 30 years. And on top of this, we now politicize the market with demands on companies to pursue an array of identity politics claims and to engage in so-called CSR practices, ESG investing. And our corporate leadership eagerly complies with these dictates, thus contributing to the undermining of the market system. So the market is an aspect of civil society and accordingly functions best when it is as immune as possible from politics, enabling people to participate freely according to their talents and their interests and not according to their politics or identities. So thinking about the problem that we're in, why, why is this? So Nicholas Eberstadt in his 2020 Irving Crystal Address, uh, which I think bears rereading, describes the tangle of pathologies, quote unquote, um, that mark America. And he says, quote, when post-war economic growth began its long slowdown, America entered into a new social compact with the poorer half of its people. Call it our modern declaration of dependence. Both parties have engaged in this. And that is between 1985 and 2017, the share of Americans in homes depending on poverty benefits more than doubled, and America's means-tested citizenry nearly tripled. In effect, nearly all of our population increase since the Reagan era was of means-tested Americans. In 2017, over one in four prime-age American men took poverty-conditioned benefits, triple the share in 1985. If we add in payments from disability programs, even more were on the government dole. Yet, Eberstadt observes in commentary on the endangered American middle class, rising welfare dependence is hardly ever mentioned. Why? If you seek and accept public benefits eligible only to the poor, your membership in the middle class is in jeopardy, and you probably know it. That's quoting Nicholas there. And this will inevitably have consequences on household financial probity as Americans' dependence on public largesse increased, $6,000 on average per recipient. Their net worth also decreases. 
So we are also plagued with special interest, carving out markets and rents for themselves, courtesy of the federal government and its regulatory and tax code apparatus. What, after all, can better launch the takeover of healthcare, energy, education, transportation, than the state insuring receipts for companies that would otherwise struggle in voluntary market conditions? So in the nexus between government and corporations, we find, not surprisingly, that revenue and rents flow upward to well-connected companies that have invested in the system. Almost 20% of publicly traded companies in America, this would be publicly listed companies, are so-called zombie corporations, whose annual revenues fail to cover their annual borrowing costs. They perpetually borrow to stay afloat, a situation made possible in many respects by the Federal Reserve and its easy money policies. And this would also resemble what the Bank of Japan did for close to 30 years, lending to laggard companies and sapping productivity and capital formation for new businesses in the process. The losers are the entrepreneurs and companies either not created or stymied are forced to sell prematurely to more established competitors as they struggle to overcome the numerous barriers to their success. To quote Eberstadt again, the ratio of new startups to existing businesses has been falling for over 40 years, end quote. So think about that. This is also a, sig a signal to Americans that the economy isn't open to everyone, and our elites are content with an economy regulated unjustly, operating on anti-competitive terms. And this has also all happened, I think it bears repeating, amidst an age of emancipated individualism, enforced by our courts, our bureaucracies, our schools, and popular culture. In short, I think, uh, perfect individualism has opened to perfect statism, a dialectic diagnosed by Tocqueville, Nisbet, Charles Murray, among others. So this is yet another reason why we are here, to rearticulate the case for political solidarity, membership and citizenship, and the nation, a prerequisite to the recovery of markets and growth. So in his essay, The Truth About Nationalism, Roger Scruton observes that there are several bonding principles in history for political solidarity and membership, empire, creed, family, the tribe. But how do we get to tolerance, learning, trade? And Roger Scruton claims that these crucial aspects of modernity rest on national loyalty. Enlightenment requires borders. That is, feelings of sentiment and loyalty, not to a family, a tribe, a religious a doctrine or person, but for a country defined by a territory and the history and culture and law that have made that territory ours. So we need that process of the nation. Am I running short on time? Two minutes, wow, okay. So <laughs> moving forward then, moving forward then, thinking about, uh, thinking about Rupka. Um, so what does it mean then morally uh, to justify free markets? The question Rupka raised uh, and others known as the Ordo liberals in the ashes of Nazi despotism. They outline the need for political constitutionalism and the rule of law to prevent cartelism, a problem that had plagued Germany since the 1870s. So we need a market economy with a firm moral, political, and institutional framework, a minimum standard of business ethics, a strong state, a sensible market police, and well-weighed laws appropriate to the economic system. Buying and selling, laboring, investing are the basic elements of commerce when backed by legal and comoral restraints have a remarkable capacity to facilitate spontaneous individual choices. And this also does something else Rupp emphasized, which is to free prices, to free prices from government control and from cartels, cartels becoming the principle of the state and the principle of the market, and inhibiting the signals we can send to one another about what we want. So Rupka was never satisfied, though, with understanding a free economy as a self-justifying mechanism outside of moral and civic considerations. And I think our experiences over the last 50 or 60 years in the West, in most Western democracies, prove him right. Um, at the heart of his reflection, though, 
something we should all bear in mind, is the anthropological question, who is man? The failure to answer this question correctly spells doom, not only for the free market, but for liberal society as a whole. Rupka stated in his 1960 book, A Humane Economy, quote, my picture of man is fashioned by the full spiritual heritage of classical and Christian tradition. I see in man the likeness of God. I am profoundly convinced that it is an appalling sin to reduce man to a means, even in the name of high sounding phrases, and that each man's soul is something unique, irreplaceable, priceless in comparison with which all other things are as not. Opposed to this anthropology is the public policy that aims in equality in every respect and detail, ignoring the nature and complexity of the person. And so not to give up on liberalism is to, is to do something that Rupka uh, articulated as uh, respecting an end of our soul higher than government, higher necessarily than the market, higher than what we're doing in any sort of democratic context, but that the person was made for ends beyond the state. If we keep that in mind, then we have the basis for a muscular liberalism that can withstand the ideologies, the illiberalisms of our age. It starts with understanding the dignity of man. It starts with understanding that apart from the liberal state are things like freedom of the church, the family, the sacred man, pursuing those things, those projects, in concert with others. And government exists to protect that civil society, that conception of a muscular, sober liberalism. And that is where the market economy can truly flourish. Thank you. Thank you.